Good morning, everyone. Thanks for tuning into News 3 Now on this beautiful Friday, December 3rd. Whew, deep breath. We made it to Friday. We are almost done into another great weekend here in Bryan College Station and in the Brazos Valley. Tons of Christmas events, Hanukkah events happening over the weekend. We've got a great show lined up for you today. I'm very excited to welcome our guests. So let me tell you a little bit about what we're going to be talking about today. So Representative John Rainey actually just returned home from a trip down to the Texas-Mexico border. And we are lucky enough to have him joining us on the show today. He's just going to be able to tell us a little bit about his experience. So let's welcome him to the show right now. Well, thank you, Abigail. We're happy, happy yes. to be here with you. Well, we really appreciate it. And I know that it was a little bit of a bumpy road to get you home safely, but we're happy to have you with us this morning. And you know, Representative, I think for folks who don't know, could you just tell us first and foremost, you know, where were you and what was the purpose of your trip? Well, uh, my, the purpose of my trip, of course, was to go down and see uh, what was going on in the in the valley. We've heard lots of things and uh, uh, it's, it's very concerning what we hear. I wanted to kind of see for myself what was going on. We uh, flew from Austin down to Wesley Co, uh, took a helicopter, uh, ride along the river uh, there and then got on uh, gunboats and rode in the in the uh, Rio Grande to see uh, what was going on and then uh, uh, of course I forgot to tell them maybe the most important thing we had a, a wonderful uh, uh, talk by the DPS people down there that gave us an outline of what all they've been doing and uh, how successful their operation was uh, the most important thing we all have to remember is that the state of Texas is not in charge of immigration. What we're down there for and what the DPS and about 6,000 uh, National Guard folks are down there is to uh, interdict the drug and the human trafficking and, uh, that's, and, and to fight uh, any crime that might be brought across. Uh, I think we're doing a good job at that. The problem is uh, there's just so many people coming across that it's difficult to uh, catch them all. Well, you know, it's interesting that you were able to go down there, which is going to be great. I'm going to have you tell us about, you know, more about your experience, things that you saw, because luckily for us, DPS does hold that weekly press conference that we're able to kind of take live. We hear things from them, and really all we've seen is what other media outlets have been able to show us. and. You know, rumors are circulating. We just hear, we've never actually, I assume most of us have never actually been down and traveled around like you did through the river. Tell us a little bit about what you saw down there. Well, you know, one of the things that we saw was uh, on the river, uh, actually I didn't see any people coming across at any point. Uh, they may have been going in. And I think most of the people that are coming across are coming across from Laredo and up in that area rather than uh, at McAllen at the present time. I saw a lot of the border wall that has been completed. The last time I went, and I don't remember how long ago that was, it may be a six or eight years ago, uh, there was no border wall at all. Uh, unfortunately, it hasn't been completed, but the DPS tells me that that is uh, a strong deterrent and helps move the traffic or funnel it into certain areas so they are able to uh, do what they need to do. Uh, there's also a portion of the wall that has been built that was uh, done by independent uh, people that uh, I think they did a GoFundMe type thing that uh, built a, several miles of wall down there. The my, wall is not complete. Uh, there are those that say it won't work, but what the DPS tells me is that it, it is driving the folks that come across into areas that make it easier for them to pick them up. So that's that's the main thing. I did see on the on the, um, the river uh, boats. I saw lots of um, uh, pontoons or, or uh, canvas type boats, plastic boats that had deflated and and were along the bank. And where you saw that, you would see trails going up into. Uh, the Texas side where people had been going through in big numbers. So uh, we know that they're coming. Uh, we know what they bring. The most frightening thing to me is the human trafficking element. And I think it's it's the most um, 
disheartening to me. Uh, we we live in a country where we think we're all free, and and this is a, a, a type of slavery as far as I'm concerned. When you uh, put somebody into the, a human trafficking situation, you're you're in problem. One of the things I did learn during uh, the briefing was that uh, uh, there were people here in Texas who were driving down and being paid uh, substantial amounts of money to transport uh, these folks that are coming across and, and bypassing the border patrol and running, as they call it, uh, paid big money, as much as $1,000 a person, to bring them to other parts of Texas. One of the distressing things I heard and was that there was a 17-year-old young lady who was from uh, Tyler who came down and she was caught. And her father had said, hey, you go down there and pick these folks up and bring them back and I'll split the money with you. Uh, from what the DPS told me, the young lady really didn't know what she was doing, that, that she was uh, bringing people in from across the river. Uh, that 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 is a uh, bothers me from a human standpoint. I think about my own children and my grandchildren, and and it's it's just uh, somewhat frightening. Uh, the other thing we learned was the amount of drugs and things like that that they have have captured in uh, in their uh, activities that they're taking place. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna look right here and, so I can get you the numbers, but uh, well, they've captured in, in uh, this year alone, they've captured 2,833 uh, people for criminal trespass. Now that, that sounds like, well, wh what about criminal trespass? What that does, it gives them an opportunity to look in to the other activity that these people may have been involved in and therefore uh, find something that uh, might uh, uh, lead to a, a reason to detain them for other reasons. Uh, 76,000 uh, felony charges, uh, 67,000 misdemeanor charges, uh, 496 federal charges, and uh, those are the kinds of things that we've done. Um, marijuana seizures, 13 thousand pounds cocaine uh, 2500 pounds um, meth 1647 pounds 37 pounds of heroin and here's one that scares me the most 157 pounds of fentanyl and I you know I'm, I grew up in an age where um, I didn't know anything still don't know a whole lot about drugs I admit but fentanyl is a very very dangerous drug it's a uh, opioid uh, uh, type drug, but it only takes two milligrams of fentanyl uh, to kill a person. And we're talking about 50, 157 pounds. That's frightening. And we know for sure that uh, uh, that's just a portion of what has come across. Uh, they wouldn't be continuing to try to bring it across if it wasn't making them large amounts of money. Absolutely. And Representative, I like what you said. You said that, you know, this is a human issue. I care about this as a human, not because I'm a political representative, because I'm a human. We talk about drugs. We talk about human trafficking. I know there are people across the nation and also right here in Brazos County that think, well, you know, we're kind of far away from the border. Why should we care? How does it impact us? What would you say to those people? Well, I'll just say this. First of all, the, from an immigration side, it affects the schools that we have in every school. Uh, county in Texas. Uh, it, and and I, I'm one of those guys I said, if, if they're here, we need to educate them. There's no doubt about that. Education is the key to uh, the economy of, of our country. But uh, when they come in and they uh, flood our school systems, the, the financial repercussions of that are, are tremendous. And uh, uh, I, I begin to wonder how we're going to continue to fund education if we continue to uh, have all of these people come in who uh, uh, are not citizens. And so I think maybe the last question I have for you, and I'm sure I'll say that and then think about something else, but we'll try to keep it short. 
as our state representative, as a representative here in Brazos County, how has what you've seen and experienced and talked to DPS about going to change or impact maybe any decisions that you're going to be making in the future? Well, I think one of the things we need to do is is maybe give the DPS a little more authority in, in arresting people and the punishments uh, need to be looked at uh, to see what we can do uh, to discourage this sort of activity. The most important thing we have to do is uh, convince the federal government that uh, it is a terrible issue, that it is an issue that impacts every citizen of this country and that we need to be careful with what was going on. We don't know how many people uh, are coming across who are coming across with not only uh, COVID, uh, with anger toward our country. Uh, we have people from all over the world. It's not just people from Central America that are coming. So we need to have control of our border in order to protect our, our citizens. And we need for the federal government to react in that way. I knew I'd think of one more question for you. So if there is a concern, <laughs> if there's a viewer and they're thinking, you know, I'm concerned about this, I want to do something. Is there something that a concerned citizen like me right here can do? I mean, is it just a matter of voting for the right people? Well, I, I do think it's for, uh, a matter of voting for the right people, but uh, I, I think that we have a disconnect between what's important in Texas and important to us and what the federal government is looking at. I honestly don't know how you convince somebody who does not think it's affecting them uh, to vote to control our border. Uh, this is a, a total failure of, of the current administration. I, I, uh, I, I'm, I know I'm a Republican and I've been a Republican all my life, but that doesn't have anything to do with it. What is, is concerns me is the safety of our people, the safety of the people that are coming across, and the basically imprisonment or, or slavery that these people who are being human trafficked, uh, they're coming into our country and, and uh, uh, we have a, another uh, period of slavery as far as I'm concerned. Representative, anything else that you want people to know about your trip, about anything that you learned while you were down there? Well, I think I've covered most of it. I'm sure there'll be something I think of. You, you said you think of something later. I probably will too. But I think I've done about all I can uh, do at this point. And hopefully uh, the people of our country will recognize the dangers on the border and, and begin to do something about it. Representative John Rainey, thank you so much for joining us on the show today to talk about your trip. We're glad you made it home safely. Thank you. It was extremely interesting to hear a firsthand recount of Representative Rainey's trip down. Now, he was in Westlaco and McAllen. He was talking about going across the Rio Grande Valley and the river with DPS, talking to DPS about some of the statistics, some of the drug seizures, human trafficking statistics that he's seen down there. Like I said to him, you know, it's interesting because I think a majority of us, not just here in Texas, really across the nation, we don't know, we don't have firsthand experience down there. We probably haven't been, and we certainly haven't, you know, had a meeting with DPS, and we haven't been taken out on boats across the river with DPS officers and law enforcement agents. So hearing that recount from our state representative, hearing about, you know, how he makes decisions and how this is going to impact his decisions, our decisions as a nation, as a state, super interesting. Thank you to Representative John Rainey for coming up on the show today. Thanks for going down on that trip and uh, recounting your experiences. We appreciate having you here. Well, while we're talking about board, the border crisis and how it relates to us here and really across the entire United States, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, but the Biden administration is set to resume that Trump era policy remain in Mexico. Now remember, that's the policy that forces asylum seekers to wait for court hearings outside of the United States, sometimes in tents along borders, uh, city borders. So basically, what happened is that a federal judge ruled that 
the Biden administration could not end the program. Remember, Texas and Missouri sued the administration when they tried to get rid of it. U.S. border authorities could start returning migrants back to Mexico as soon as Monday. All right, we're going to kind of transition now away from talking about the border. We're going to talk about this month's jobs report. Earlier this morning, President Biden delivered some remarks about what things look like. So let me give a quick recap about some of the stuff we talked about. America's economic recovery is slowing a bit. The Labor Department says employers added 210,000 jobs to the economy last month in November. That's well below analysts' expectations. It's also the smallest number of jobs added since December 2020. Some economists expect hiring to slow down this month because of concerns over the new Omicron coronavirus variant. Meanwhile, the unemployment rate fell to 4.2%, which is good. It's a new pandemic era low, but overall, the economy is still down nearly 4 million jobs from pre-pandemic levels. Boy, we have been talking about this for quite some time. Whew, another deep breath because the government will not be shutting down today. Both chambers passed that stopgap bill late last night to extend funding through mid-February. The bill is now heading to President Biden's desk, and he is expected, of course, to sign it right away. This is going to give Congress more time to work out a longer-term funding plan. Well, the EPA says more than $50 billion have been set aside to fix the nation's water infrastructure. The money, of course, is from that new bipartisan infrastructure law. The agency says it's the single largest investment in water that the federal government has ever made. Officials want states to use the funding to address environmental impacts faced by historically underserved communities. All right, we've got a couple of local stories that we're following that happened this morning. A couple of crashes, a couple of traffic incidents that I want to make sure I get to right away at the beginning of the show today. Ryan police are currently investigating a fatal crash that happened earlier this morning. The department says an 18-wheeler and an SUV crashed at the intersection of West Highway 21 and West OSR around 630. The driver of the SUV was killed. Their identity has not been released at this time. OSR is closed right now at the intersection, so expect delays if you're in the area. And one more to be aware of, a major wreck involving an 18-wheeler shut down traffic on southbound Interstate 45 at Park Road 40 near mile marker 106 between Huntsville and New Waverly. Traffic is being diverted to the feeder road at Park Road 40 now, according to this Facebook post from the Walker County Constable Precinct 4, around 8 a.m., SH-75 is also being used as an alternate route. And that post says that, you know, traffic on the feeder route, uh, road is actually backed up from the county line and into Huntsville. So traffic is going to be slow and heavy. They say use caution, give yourself time. Well, concerns are rising over the spread of the Omicron variant to more states across America. The strain has already been detected in at least five states. Experts think the real number is likely much higher. Yesterday, New York State reported at least five cases of the variant more than any other state. So far, all cases of the strain in the U.S. have been mild, but the uncertainty is taking a toll. Nikki Batiste reports from New York. The holidays are here, and with them, concerns about the Omicron variant, as millions of Americans shop, gather, and travel for the season. On Thursday, New York became the first state to detect multiple Omicron cases, all five in the greater New York area. 
we have to assume that means there's community spread. We have to assume that means we're going to see a lot more cases. Two other cases of the Omicron variant were also announced Thursday. Both patients reported mild symptoms. One case was a Colorado woman who had recently returned from Southern Africa. She was vaccinated but had not received a booster. The second case was detected in a Minnesota man who received a booster in early November and whose only recent travel was an anime convention in New York City. What COVID is doing is it's learning, it's adapting. Dr. Tom Frieden is the former director of the Centers for Disease Control. He says it will take weeks at least before we know if Omicron causes more serious illness or if it can evade our protection. If you're older or immunosuppressed or you live with someone who's older or immunosuppressed, you're going to want to be more careful. Indoor spaces, I think everyone should be masked. Health officials are urging all of the 53,000 people who attended the anime convention in New York City to get tested immediately. And Americans who are looking for a shot, whether it's their first or their third, should visit vaccines.gov or text their zip code to 438829 to find a free vaccine near you. Nikki Batiste, CBS News, New York. Europe is seeing a spike in COVID-19 cases and there is growing concern it could get worse with the Omicron variant. Some countries are imposing tough restrictions ahead of the holidays. CBS's Ian Lee reports. Germany, Germany wants, wants to, to keep, keep the, the party, party going, going. But, to but to avoid future, future lockdowns, lockdowns the, party the party is over for the unvaccinated. The government, the government is restricting them from all, all but essential businesses, businesses like supermarkets, supermarkets and, pharmacies. and pharmacies. Germany, Germany is, currently is currently dealing with its, with its worst, worst COVID, COVID outbreak. outbreak. Their Air Force recently, recently resumed flights, flights to move critical, critical COVID, COVID patients, patients from overwhelmed regions to ones, to ones less, less affected. affected. And, with and with new concerns, concerns about the Omicron, Omicron variant, variant, authorities, authorities are, considering are considering making vaccines, vaccines mandatory, mandatory as early as, as February. February. Neighboring, Neighboring Austria, Austria imposed, imposed its strict lockdown, lockdown last month as COVID, as COVID cases, cases grew out of control. Out of control. To help end it, children, children are rolling, rolling up their, up their sleeves. sleeves. The country, the country recently, recently approved the Pfizer, Pfizer vaccine, vaccine for kids, kids as young as five. Here, Here in the in UK, the UK COVID, COVID cases, cases remain high, high but, Prime but Prime Minister Boris Johnson has played, played down, down any talk, talk of a lockdown, lockdown saying, saying it's, it's important, important for everyone, everyone eligible, eligible to get, to get their, booster. their booster. Whatever, Whatever Omicron, Omicron may or may not be able to do, it certainly will not negate the overall value of the, of the boosters. As attention turns, turns toward the upcoming, upcoming Winter, Winter Olympic, Olympic Games, Games in China, in China people, people are worried. The country, the country continues, continues to report, report new COVID, COVID cases despite, despite harsh, harsh restrictions, restrictions and, its and its zero COVID, COVID policy. policy. Beijing, Beijing says, says the show will go, will go on, on. But, but because of COVID, COVID it'll, it'll look similar to last summer's Games in Tokyo with no international fans allowed. Ian Lee, CBS News, London. But unlike the Tokyo Games, local fans will be allowed to attend the Games, but they have to follow strict COVID rules. Well, President Biden is once again pushing vaccinations and booster shots here in the United States. His administration has a new strategy to fight the potential winter surge. It includes more COVID testing for travelers, extending the transportation mask mandate until at least March, and launching a campaign encouraging 100 million adults to get their boosters with a focus on senior citizens. This is a moment we can do what we haven't been able to do enough of through this whole pandemic. Get the nation to come together, unite the nation to come in purpose. Well, the president also announced more than 60 federal winter COVID emergency response teams ready to battle outbreaks in each individual state. A new survey shows most vaccinated adults already are planning to, to get their booster shots. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation, 60% said they'll definitely get a booster or they already have. The survey was conducted last month when all vaccinated adults first became eligible for those boosters. People who identify as Republican were less likely to get a booster. Also, young black and Hispanic people reported they are less likely to get a booster shot. For Americans over 50, nearly 70% said they plan to get the shot or they already have. That includes a majority of both Democrats and Republicans. Let's pop over to our KBTX COVID-19 dashboard and see what our numbers look like for us here in the Brazos County today. 
Active cases rose by one today. Yesterday they were 193, and today we're hitting 194. Uh, New cases are on the rise again, and how tall is she? She's about my height. Two new COVID-19 deaths today. Now, remember, earlier this week, we saw two breakthrough vaccine deaths. That's a total of four deaths this week being reported by the health district. These two were both unvaccinated patients. Hospitalizations remain the same. Yeah, they used to make the back of the cards white. Now they're red. (laughs) It's like that doesn't help me any. That should be good. Okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah, that should be okay. I appreciate it. Medical abortions are now banned in Texas after seven weeks of pregnancy. The new law makes it a felony to provide abortion-inducing medication after seven weeks. It also makes it a crime to send the medication through the mail. According to state health officials, medical abortion is the most common way Texas pregnancies are terminated. Well, we're going to take a live look right now at the school in Michigan where there was a school shooting earlier this week. So this is outside of the school. You see the flags raised at half staff. And of course, school is not in session this week. And it's actually been a very concerning week for students at multiple schools here in Texas due to several unrelated incidents involving firearms. That includes one that happened in Milam County. Cameron ISD says someone reportedly fired a BB or airsoft gun at students who were walking home from school. This happened on Tuesday and again on Wednesday near Fannin Avenue and 22nd Street. The Cameron School District asked that parents and students be aware of their surroundings and report any suspicious or concerning activity to the police. It wasn't only Cameron ISD, a high school student in Katy was taken out of class after reportedly bringing a firearm to school. The school's principal says another student saw the weapon and informed staff but no threats were ever made. They also said the gun was not loaded when it was confiscated. The school says the incident serves as a teachable moment to talk with kids about reporting dangerous activity. Well, as Ghislaine Maxwell's sex abuse trial enters its fifth day, we're taking a closer look at the psychology behind human trafficking. Maxwell is accused of finding teenage girls for Jeffrey Epstein's alleged sex abuse ring. Some of the alleged victims say Epstein paid them to recruit other girls. Lola Lange looks at the complicated line between victim and accomplice. He joins us from the federal courthouse in Manhattan, where the trial is taking place. I want a fresh start. start. Haley, Haley Robson, Robson says, says she, she first met, met Jeffrey, Jeffrey Epstein, Epstein in 2002. 2002. She was an she was unsuspecting 16 year old high schooler in West Palm Beach, Beach Florida, Florida when a classmate when recruited her. I was told the more you do, the more you make. I was told, you know, it would be possibly in your bra and underwear, but it would just be a massage. Desperate to leave behind childhood trauma, Robson agreed to go to Epstein's Palm Beach estate. She says the massage turned into something more when Epstein masturbated and fondled her. When he tried to take take it further, further, she she says she refused. refused. That's That's when he offered offered to pay her $200 for every girl she brought brought to him. Did you realize the damage damage that he was doing doing to you? you? I did not not understand understand that I was was being being sexually abused. Robson Robson recalls seeing seeing a girl girl come out of the bathroom with them, both in towels. She was just very closed off, like holding herself like this, and walking out of the room with her head bent. And I know that one. It was, it was probably one of the most old images besides, besides the actual views that, that I have. have, have, have. have. Andrea, Andrea Powell, Powell is founder of Corona Rising, a support, a support group for victims of sexual abuse, abuse and exploitation. She, she says, says most, most sex trafficking victims are subjected to a complicated, complicated cocktail of reward and, and abuse. If you break it down, traffickers have three strategies. And one is, I can be, I can your, be daddy, your daddy, I can be your protector. Be your protector. The, other the other is, I can, I can be your lover, lover I, can I can be your boyfriend, boyfriend your partner. And the other is, I can make your life better, I can fulfill your dreams. And Epstein, Epstein was able, was to, able kind to kind of combine, combine all of that. that. Robson, Robson says she went on to recruit eight, eight other, other girls. girls. Some, people Some people look at me and they don't know where, where to place me. me. Were you a recruiter? Were you a victim? Therapist Randy, Randy Hogan, Hogan has been, has been working, working with Robson for the last, last two years. years. Well, there was a lot of work to be done with Haley on forgiving herself for making decisions that she did not have 
You know, I mean, and he said looking back it. again through the variants well, that Robinson says she never, never met Glenn Maxwell, Maxwell and is not, and is part, not of part of the government's, government's case, case against Maxwell. Maxwell. She has, she been, has been compared to her. her. She used her gender to ultimately build trust with underage girls. And it's not like she's 16 and doesn't know any better. She's an adult. Where is the line between recruiting while still, while being, still victimized being victimized and, and an, an actual, actual criminal, criminal accomplice. accomplice. The, line the line is, can, can you walk, walk away? away? Can, can you get, get out? out? And, 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 and I, don't I don't just mean physically, physically. I, mean I mean psychologically. psychologically. Robson, Robson remembers, remembers when, it when it all hit her. her. I, was I was sitting in the shower, shower just, just scrubbing, scrubbing my skin. skin. Scrubbing, scrubbing it. Because I just felt so dirty. But some stains don't wash away. The guilt will never go away. There, there is, is not, not a, day a day that goes, goes by, by that, that I don't think about, think about the, other the other girls. Well, Glenn, well, Glenn Maxwell, Maxwell has denied, denied knowing, knowing anything, anything about Jeffrey Epstein's, Epstein's alleged, alleged sex trafficking operation, and she has she pleaded, pleaded not guilty, not guilty to, the to the criminal charges, charges against, against her. her. Mola Lange, CBS, CBS News, News Manhattan. Manhattan. Let's give them a big round of applause. Well, happening right now, Governor Greg Abbott is going to be delivering remarks at the roll-off ceremony for the new 2022 Toyota Tundra pickup truck. He's in San Antonio. The San Antonio is home to Toyota's truck assembly plant, which assembles Your full-size Tundra and Your dedication to bringing our Tacoma customers the all-new 2022 Tundra so is what makes us successful. We're going to take things live to San successful. Antonio, where that presentation me, is happening what now. What a time to lead the best team in the best city in the best state. I was fortunate enough to begin, begin my, my journey, journey with Toyota, Toyota right here in San Antonio in 2005. In 2005. And, and now it's my great honor to support, to support this plant in its first major model change since we started building trucks. You know, our groundbreaking ceremony was in 2003. And since then, we've invested over $3.1 billion in our facility, donated over $45 million, and given countless volunteer hours to support our great community and state. What a journey this project has been. The past year has presented significant challenges for all of us. When COVID-19 hit in March of 2020, no one knew what was coming. And then in 2021, when Texas was hit with an unprecedented winter storm, through all of it, Toyota Texas and our team members remain focused on getting us to this moment. Thank you. Today, we celebrate the hard work and dedication and this accomplishment that's been years in the making, starting with a $391 million investment in 2019 to prepare the facility and over 1.2 million hours of construction. Production has started. There's no question we're delivering the toughest, most capable, and most advanced tundra today. With so much to celebrate today, and here to help us kick things off, is Toyota North America Chief Administrative Officer and the former Executive Vice President of Manufacturing, who led our investment for this model change, Chris Reynolds. Hey, y'all. Look at that truck. It is an amazing truck. Thank you, Kevin. And, and good, good morning, morning Team Toyota, Toyota Texas. Texas. Governor Abbott, Mr. Mayor, Mayor Judge Wolf, and, and distinguished guests. guests. I am so pleased that you could join us here at our Texas, Texas plant because I'm so excited for you to see our great Texas team members all around you who give it their all and go above and beyond to bring our customers the best trucks around. Let's give another round of applause to those team members. And, and Kevin, Kevin is absolutely right. right. Despite, Despite the many challenges they face, our team members remain laser-focused on preparing for this, all, this moment, the all-new Tundra lineup. They know that this full-size truck is so important to the segment, but also for Toyota's overall lineup to offer a portfolio of products for our customers to choose from. And as we all know in this business, the customer gets to make the choice, and they're going to choose this great truck over and over and over again. Now, today also marks the next milestone in our company's continuing efforts to reach carbon neutrality for our vehicles and operations by 2050. 
with the Tundra's all-new iForce Max hybrid engine, say that five times fast, right? We're adding yet another option to our already wide variety of products, powertrains and technology into our lineup. Everything from fuel-efficient internal combustion engines to battery electrics to hybrids to plug-ins, governors, we discussed fuel cells. Hey, Toyota has it all. We believe this department store approach to our powertrains and to our vehicles is a faster and quicker way to carbon neutrality. And we're not new to this game. Uh, as you know, Toyota has sold more electrified vehicles than any other automaker, including that one that starts with a T. And we're determined to continue that leadership. Toyota has sold more than 18.7 million alternative powertrain vehicles globally. Just think about that. 4.1 million alone in this country. Here in the U.S., our 17 Toyota and Lexus electrified vehicles account for 24% of our total sales. And by 2030, get this, we expect that number to go up to nearly 70%, which would be about 1.5 million to 1.8 million electrified vehicles including zero emission vehicles. So I think everybody agrees, certainly we at Toyota all agree, that the future of the auto industry is electrified. And with the help of the all new Tundra Hybrid, Toyota intends to be the big dog in this space, like we are today. I had, I had to say, to say big, big dog, dog because that, that truck reminds me of Clifford, the, the big, big red dog. dog. I, mean, I mean, look at that. that. That's, That's a beautiful truck. truck. Now, now, I can't, I can't wait, wait to get behind the wheel of this vehicle. vehicle. Not, Not only to test the iForce Max hybrid powertrain, powertrain, and I had, I had to practice, practice that, guys, but, but because, because it's, it's built right here in San Antonio by our great team members, by y'all. You know, it's been over 18 years since our Toyota Texas plant became a valued member of this community. During that time, TMMTX established itself as an advocate of STEM education and workforce development. We're giving back to the community. And as a mobility company, Toyota supports organizations that focus on moving communities forward, whether that's on the road, in a classroom, or in neighborhoods all around the U.S. So, as part of that commitment, to continue our commitment, today, I am pleased to announce that we are donating a total of $650,000 to eight community partners. Let's give a hand. Now, as I call off, I'd like representatives from each group to please stand. The Via Transit Authority, where are you? Great. The San Antonio Food Bank. And our six great public school districts right here in our backyard. Where are you? Thank you, each of you, all of you, for your valuable contributions that you and your organizations have made right here in San Antonio. One more hand and a round of applause. Now, it's employers like us and community partners like you and leadership like we have here on the stage that help make the Lone Star State one of the top places to raise a family, to build a business, certainly build a tundra, and create greater opportunities for everyone. It's my honor to introduce a man who is dedicated to Texas and helps make all of this possible, a native Texan, He's been a devoted public servant for 25 years. Please join me in welcoming our great governor, the Honorable Governor of Texas, Greg Abbott. Well, thank you, Chris. It's great to be here with you as well as uh, Team Toyota. Uh, as, as well, well as with, with the other public, public officials and people from across the community. Before, Before I begin, I, I want to thank everybody with Toyota, Toyota but I, I particularly want to call out 
the men and women who are wearing the hard hats in the back of the room who construct and build these great Toyota trucks. Thank you for your hard work every single day. I want to start my remarks by making a very important point, and that is so many people across the entire world know very well about the superior product that Toyota makes. But not enough people know as much about the substantial role that Toyota plays in shaping the great state of Texas. To, get, to put all this into context, let me explain this one fact. In just the first 11 months of this year, there are 70 businesses that relocated their headquarters to Texas. Mathematically, that is, a new headquarters moved to Texas every five days during the course of this year. And that is not counting facilities like the massive new semiconductor plant by Samsung that was announced last week, as well as the $30 billion Texas Instrument semiconductor plant announced the week before that. I mentioned those two because semiconductor chips from both Texas Instruments as well as Samsung are used by Toyota in their products. Here's my point, though, and that is all of these companies that are moving to Texas, that are growing in Texas, they are following a trail that was actually blazed by Toyota. Toyota was the original pioneer coming into the Lone Star State and broke ground in 2003 and has flourished in Texas so much and they enjoy doing business in Texas so much the decade after breaking ground here, they decided to move their North America headquarters right here to the great state of Texas. But the thing about Toyota is that for us it is far more than just a business. Toyota is a valued partner for our state. They are literally part of the Texas success story economically, and we enjoy so much about the way they give back to the community. What you've done for the community in your announcement, Chris, earlier today is a clear example of the way Toyota does more than just look out for the bottom line of their business. They look out for the bottom line of their entire community, and I can tell you for a fact, the community of San Antonio and Bexar County in the state of Texas are better because of Toyota and everything that Toyota does in the great state of Texas. But it's, it's even more personal than that because, as you all know, you have leaders in your company that are so personal, so engaging that we have developed a bond and a friendship. And I've had the opportunity to develop a close first personal bond of friendship with Akira Toyota himself. And if you know him, you know he's quite hilarious. He may be the, the funniest, most engaging businessman I've ever met. I've had him in the governor's mansion several times, and the first time he showed up at the governor's mansion, I'm trying to figure out how to properly dress and act and things like that, and I wore a coat and tie. And much to my amazement, when Akira Toyota showed up to the governor's mansion for the first time, he was, he was wearing, wearing a, a Bucky's T-shirt. <laughs> so I, I got to know him also when I took several trips to, to, uh, to Japan. And uh, one time when I was visiting with him, we had a private dinner at a restaurant together. And he took me downstairs to a parking lot. And he wanted to show me what he had in the parking lot at this restaurant in Japan. He had a Toyota Tundra right there in the parking lot, and he, he, he told me, he said, Governor, this truck was born in Texas, built by Texans, now in Japan. That is how proud he is of what you do right here in Texas. More important, however, is that the future of Texas and Toyota in Texas is just as profound as Toyota's past in Texas. And that's why all of us are so proud to be here for the unveiling of the 2022 Toyota Tundra, the latest in a long line of Toyota trucks that are built exclusively in Texas.
the fact of the matter is, is there is no label more powerful than made in Texas. Texas. And, and we, we are, are proud of the products made by Toyota right here in San Antonio, Texas. Texas. Today's unveiling of the 2022 Tundra is a celebration of Toyota's innovation and manufacturing mastery. And it is a testament to what businesses can achieve in the great state of Texas. God bless you all, God bless Toyota, and God bless the great state of Texas. I have the pleasure as serving as the Vice President of Manufacturing. In case you're just tuning in Texas. and wondering what we were just watching, Governor Abbott is down in San Antonio for the Toyota's roll-off ceremony for the new Bringing a new vehicle to market truck. is no small task. He was just getting some It is a multi-year process with teams well, of Madisonville dedicated Madisonville leaders employees are narrowing down their search enterprise. for a new city manager. And assembling the vehicle is just one component apply. People from in the across process. the country. Mayor from Bill Carton says to design, they're down to a pool of about Toyota's five candidates. research and development facilities in California and Michigan worked with manufacturing to bring their vision to life. Before joining Team Texas, I had the honor of being dispatched to Japan where I worked in Toyota production engineering. I was part of a team evaluating the changes required here at The mayor expects to have the new city manager selected by early the 2022 Tundra. These included new technologies like Local aluminum body panels, care experts are calling advanced for hydrogen regulations to be and premium paint this process. comes as seven families are suing the North America the team Crockett. also worked now, to create I'm a about first to show you in some class, surveillance footage from highly advanced that appears to show welding the process abuse. called the GEMA. These Pivotal three workers to the frame were arrested and the smooth the ride quality or that new tundra will be known for. This lawsuit alleges the During this time, the design group worked abused, with Texas and team members with and engineers were to form 3D virtual builds and later to build prototypes for early Attorneys identification say some of, the kids of potential have been issues. With PTSD Together, due to the issues were abuse. evaluated and resolved well, in Texas, you can search before for the one truck of daycare was ever built. If you want to know more about Our members spent years working with design and engineering, studying KTS. change points, com. The setting up new process of the Charlotte Sharp managing part logistics, says and investing state regulations should be reevaluated to train too. others. She says an all to prepare our lines for and our people is not model. enough. She also says state ratio should be you sacrifice weekends, allow one months, to as many as and years to your on this project. At one time, will our pilot members? Engineers and, and skilled teams who supported this project, so please raise your hand. customers and threatening to cut their power if they don't pay. BTU you says have our the sincere phone. gratitude. If you have questions about your account with BTU, you're asked to call their customer services department. Finally, directly. we began production trials. And during All right, trials, well, Wednesday was our 26th annual new model KBTX in a normal for production families environment, drive and oh ensuring our teams, gosh, was it a processes, and equipment we broke were ready prior to the start of production. County, and keep in mind, throughout all the process changes and trials, raised for the we Valley were still bank, assembling and a lot of us, including the previous myself, generation are tundra. probably wondering, well, okay, and with our amazing next? team's we new focus on quality, to reach we out still and find won out what the prestigious next. J.D. Power's initial quality award drive two go down in the years in a row. As a major I was nervous about setting up the record. And when that, that is a total of 12 J.D. Power awards for our previous Tundra. What a way to close an era. 
and more than 165,000 pounds of food. We've talked quite a bit about the work we've done over the last few years to get us to this point. In Burleson County, January is Wednesday, Wednesday, but I think we have the best workforce in the entire region, if not the state and even the country. So I would. I would really be happy with whatever. That we say this new tundra alone, monetary donations that we receive in Burlington, the embodiment of which is rich history, history kind of building generous world-class body on Burlington County, and nearly one, one in five households with well, children face food insecurity. Food pantries here are now better equipped to meet those needs. They said that that money and food is all that this is. The powerhouse it is. Stop. If you don't have to take my word for it, let's hear from Across them. Across the Brass Valley, Valley, the food bank and, and local food, food pantries can go into 2022, 2022 with less I wear worries. a smile on my face that's every day. I go home, bank head held high. I get to hold my daughter and love her every day because of this We're pretty much a big family. We take care of each other. We look out for each other. I really love it. When I came here, thank I wanted you, to be part of something you, big. I was driven by TBTI the commitment to excellence, the, community, the customer first, quality. Those were things that, that meant a lot to me. Working with my son here at Toyota, I can't put into words. Well, good to news, share that the with organizers of Chili Fest made a it's big announcement It's amazing working with my dad. We talk with they each other about Fest, projects that we're doing. And, you know, we like to get that. input from each other. Working here has impacted my life. I'm doing something that I love. Second, but there's no word yet on who will perform. Speaking of performing, remember I told you a little bit about something exciting that one of our local church choirs is going to get to do. Yes, Christ United Methodist Church Sanctuary Choir of College Station was invited to sing and represent Texas at the 80th anniversary of Pearl Harbor, the commemoration concert series in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. So earlier this week, I caught up with music minister James Faith to talk about the excitement over the trip and what an honor it was going to be to stand up and represent our nation at that commencement ceremony with a lot of veterans that are going to be in attendance as it is the 80th anniversary or remembrance of Pearl Harbor and you know there's James there <laughs> doing his directing but he also said you know he's looking forward for the 60 members and 35 family members to just get to enjoy Hawaii a little bit and they are off on their trip they're headed to Hawaii now James and the rest of the choir, good luck. We are proud of you and have a wonderful and relaxing time. All right, let me tell you about something really cool that is coming up in College Station. It's a fun Christmas event that helps some of our local businesses and you need to get your ticket ASAP. So that's why we're gonna talk about it right now, y'all. All right. Let me tell you about dining around Jones Crossing, supporting local businesses, getting to try foods from all kinds of restaurants and celebrating Christmas. That's all what you get to experience when you dine around Jones Crossing. It's gonna be really a variety of more than 10 different restaurants and businesses in Jones Crossing Shopping Center that are gonna be handing out free samples, promotional items, uh, all kinds of things like that. And that's what you get to do and the best part of all is that percentage of the proceeds goes back to help a nonprofit. We really, we really just, want just want people, people to enjoy, enjoy um, what, what College, College Station, Station has to offer, to offer in the new and up and coming entertainment district. And, you know, you know not, not only that, that but, but a, a, main a main piece, piece of this is, this is being, being able, able to give, to give back, back to a nonprofit. nonprofit. That nonprofit is Aggie Land Humane Society. So a percentage of the tickets are going back to Aggie Land Humane Society. And We've got the link for where you can purchase those tickets. It's $15 for kids, or sorry, $15 for adults, $8 for kids 10 and under. Like I said, access to more than 10 restaurants, other establishments, offering samples, other items. Uh, I've got the full list of participating businesses up on our website as well. It's all going to be mobile, so make sure you charge your phone. It's going to be one of those digital passports. And remember, the best part of the event is that a portion of the proceeds from ticket sales is donated back to Acumen. Which brings me to my next point. Our friends over at Avenue Community Society are running low on supplies. With the rollout of the 2022 Toyota Tundra marks a significant so boost for job creation and the economy here in San Diego. These items: paper towels, cat food, huh? greenies, pill pockets, yeah. and kitten milk. Hopefully, I'm able to hear. Okay, so those are the four things 
If you want to help, you can shop the shelter's Amazon wish list. Or you can drop off the we'll probably have to get some interviews after it. With the judge and, and the mayor, at least. All right, one more opportunity to uh, make a smile happen for kids this Christmas. <laughs> Brazos Valley Communications kicked off its 38th annual Radio Mash Toy Drive. In the coming days, you can drop off toys and items for kids at the Post Oak Mall parking lot. DJs from their stations are also broadcasting over at the site. They're collecting for kids from newborn to teenagers. Kids whose Christmas we're trying to make a little bit brighter, brighter. and uh, we've got the tent set up for broadcast live, live to starting, to, to starting this morning, morning and, we'll and we'll be out, out here through Monday, Monday morning. morning. Uh, collecting uh, toys, toys and, and money. money. So, so if you want to go out and shop, shop, shop you know, shop, shop is fun. Is fun. Yeah. Shop yeah. Is. Yeah. Well, volunteers also sort all the toys and add batteries to electronics to get them ready for Christmas. If you'd like to make monetary donations, they can also just do the shopping for you. So awesome. I love this community. So many opportunities yep. to get out and help. Brazos Valley Blessings is a nonprofit. We talked to Amber Robertson yesterday. She's the founder of that nonprofit. They need help with their community Christmas. MASH Toy Drive for Brian Broadcasting is happening in the Post Oak Mall. Also in the Post Oak Mall in the food court is Angel Tree. They are trying to uh, help some of our lower income families in need. So many ways that you can give back to help a child or family in need this holiday season. So while you're out and about, you're doing your holiday shopping for your loved ones, and then, you know, also when you see something you think, oh, that'd be cute for me, just grab one extra thing, bring it by one of those following locations, and that's all you have to do. What could you show? All right, y'all. Well, we're talking about Christmas, but let's talk a little bit about Hanukkah, because tonight is the sixth night of Hanukkah, and it is also Friday night Shabbat. One Brian Deli is celebrating the Festival of Lights by offering traditional Jewish foods. The owner of Zietman's Grocery Store in downtown Bryan is sharing dishes he learned growing up and we'll, believes we'll that they're the, uh, important to share with our community. It's just, it's just you, know, you know, it's my family, family, it's my family, family traditions, traditions, and, and uh, uh, the, the, the best, best way to keep them alive, alive is to share them. And, uh, I think they're part of I think they're, you know, they're, 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 it's, it's delicious, delicious food, food, so... so. Well, Zietman is offering a Hanukkah dinner and lots of Hanukkah favorites like latkes, matzo ball soup, and of course, my favorite, challah bread. Hey, can you hear me? Ooh, I cannot wait to head down to Zietman's grocery cool. store now. Like we'll do I a little said, mic test for y'all. Well, the rollout of the 2022 20, Toyota Tundra is a significant boost for the economy and junk freight anyway, in San Antonio. Good idea How do we to sound? stop by and grab some. The of the 2022 Toyota Tundra marks a significant boost for the junk creation. All right, I've got one more cute story for you before we take our break. And uh, like I said, it's a good one. Let me show you this. It's hilarious, okay? This is the title. It's called Arresting the Grinch. All right, let me pull this up for y'all. Okay, so arresting the Grinch. Officers saved Christmas in Hewitt, Texas yesterday when they stopped the Grinch from ruining the city's yep. tree lighting. I can. <laughs> Officers who saved Christmas by arresting the Grinch. Now, what was funny is when I first read that, I really thought that someone dressed up in a Grinch costume and was maliciously trying to destroy the tree lighting. I didn't get that it was a pretend thing for the kids and that it was acting. <laughs> um, but then I was like, okay, it's probably a good thing. I don't know. Maybe it's not. Maybe I'm right. And, uh, 
it was a negative thing and someone dressed like the Grinch was actually trying to ruin the Christmas thing. Uh, but I'm hoping that it was not. Good the afternoon. Case. It's a massive celebration right, here. The well, program is still underway here, but the role of the 2022 Toyota Tundra marks a significant boost for the economy and job creation here in the Alamo City. Now, it was initially a nearly $400 million investment announced a couple years ago to prepare for the production of this particular Tundra hybrid. Uh, since 2006, Toyota's poured $3.1 billion into this project. Now, this allowed for the facility to be expanded to accommodate new technologies for assembling the Toyota Tundra line, including the hybrid. Now, more than a few thousand jobs created out of this recent venture. We have a number of people here speaking, praising the economic benefits, including Governor Greg Abbott, San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg, and lastly, Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf, who has just wrapped up speaking. Now, lastly, Toyota has announced it is planning to give back to the community by noting, donating well over $650,000 to expand access to transportation and STEM education here in San Antonio. But for now, we're live in San Antonio. Zach Briggs, Ken's 5 Eyewitness News. Yes, I can. Thank you. One, two, three, four, five. I'll get to the side eventually. I hope you just have a lot of B-roll of the scene. There's a lot to unpack.
inside, it'll be real clear. Here's the prosecutor. Stunning details coming out of that news conference. The prosecutor making it clear that this case goes far beyond negligence, that the two parents, James and Jennifer Crumbly, will be charged with involuntary manslaughter, four counts each, each count a potential penalty of 15 years in prison. They made it clear that the boy, the 15 year old suspected shooter, received the handgun, the semi automatic six hour, as a Christmas present. The father and son perched it together. The mother practiced with the gun with him and posted online about it. The son posted pictures of his.
his new beauty. But the real disturbing news came out of the incidents in school. The day before the shooting, the 15-year-old was seen searching for ammunition on his phone. A teacher reported that. There were voicemails back and forth with the mother. But even more disturbing, the morning of the shooting, a drawing was found from the 15-year-old on it, a figure being shot by bullets and bleeding. Below was a smiley face, and above was the caption, the thoughts won't stop, help me. My life is useless, the world is dead. After this, there was a meeting between the two parents, the 15-year-old and school administrators inside the school. At the time, it's likely the 15-year-old had the weapon inside his backpack during that meeting. Yet somehow, the parents didn't mention the fact that they had just bought him a gun for Christmas. And this boy somehow, after this drawing, was allowed to return to class. Two hours later, he enters the bathroom with the backpack, comes out with the pistol, shooting, shoots 11 people point blank. Here is the prosecutor. Prosecutor said she is trying to send a message about responsibility for gun owners, and she also said the investigation continues. She said the school should never have allowed this child to go back into the classroom. She's not sure whether or not that rises to criminal negligence. Sandra, back to you. Three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. shooting, 
school officials expressed concerns about his behavior, including violent drawings and notes, and internet searches for ammunition. And just minutes after the shooting started, Jennifer Crumbly allegedly texted, don't do it, to her son. Officials claim it all adds up to a pattern of negligence that crossed the line into criminality. Meanwhile, vigils and memorial services continue here in Oxford as the community comes together to honor the victims and comfort the families. Involuntary manslaughter charges carry a penalty of up to 15 years. In Oxford, Michigan, Steve Harrigan, Fox News. The involuntary manslaughter. The involuntary manslaughter charges carry a penalty of up to 15 years. In Oxford, Michigan, Steve Harrigan, 7 News. The involuntary manslaughter charges carry a penalty of up to 15 years. In Oxford, Michigan, Steve Harrigan, News 11. The involuntary manslaughter charges carry a penalty of up to 15 years. In Oxford, Michigan, Steve Harrigan, Fox 9. The involuntary manslaughter charges carry a penalty of up to 15 years. In Oxford, Michigan, Steve Harrigan, Fox 31. The involuntary manslaughter charges carry a penalty of up to 15 years. In Oxford, Michigan, Steve Harrigan, Fox 2 News. The involuntary manslaughter charges carry a penalty of up to 15 years. In Oxford, Michigan, Steve Harrigan, Fox 4 News. The involuntary manslaughter charges carry a penalty of up to 15 years. In Oxford, Michigan, Steve Harrigan, Fox 5 News. Involuntary manslaughter charges carry a penalty of up to 15 years. In Oxford, Michigan, Steve Harrigan, Fox 35 News. The involuntary manslaughter charges carry a penalty of up to 15 years. In Oxford, Michigan, Steve Harrigan, Fox 43 News. The involuntary manslaughter charges carry a penalty of up to 15 years. In Oxford, Michigan, Steve Harrigan, Fox 12, Oregon. The involuntary manslaughter charges carry a penalty of up to 15 years. In Oxford, Michigan, Steve Harrigan, Fox 32, Chicago. The involuntary manslaughter charges carry a penalty of up to 15 years. In Oxford, Michigan, Steve Harrigan, KTVU, Fox 2, Chicago. Fox 2 News. The involuntary manslaughter charges carry a penalty of up to 15 years. In Oxford, Michigan, Steve Harrigan, KTVU, Fox 2 News. The involuntary manslaughter charges carry a penalty of up to 15 years. In Oxford, Michigan, Steve Harrigan, Fox 5 News, local outfit. <coughs> the involuntary manslaughter charges carry a penalty of up to 15 years. In Oxford, Michigan, Steve Harrigan, Fox 5 News, local Las Vegas.
Yeah, they said you can stay in Atlanta and they're booking some studio Wednesday and Thursday.
All right, y'all, welcome back to News 3 Now for the last few minutes of our show. Hope you're having a great Friday so far. December 3rd, we made it to another Friday. And hey, in case you missed it, there was snow in Bryan yesterday. You heard me right. Sioux Haswell Park was transformed into a winter wonderland. And in case you missed it, Shell got in on the fun live on air. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas everybody. everybody. <laughs> it was for the city's annual holiday magic event. There were Christmas lights, carols, hot chocolate. The biggest attraction, though, was the snow hill. Well, last year the event was canceled due to the pandemic, but families were super happy to see it return. And it is the first Friday of the month of December, which means it's first Friday in downtown Bryan. So let's pull up Destination Bryan's website because they are kind of our hub for all things First Friday. So let's try to see what is happening tonight. All right, so first Friday in downtown Bryan is happening tonight. There's going to be live music, performances, art demonstrations, interactive events and activities. All of the shops and restaurants in downtown Bryan are staying open late for the evening and it's gonna be so awesome. So there's a free concert tonight. Brazilian Farmer's Market, of course, is gonna be set up on that main strip. Uh, in front of the Queen Theater, there's going to be classic cars, live music, other performances at the south end of downtown. There's that whole um, arts hub near Mr. G's Pizzeria. Oh, underground street dancers are going to be there. Oh, downtown brand holiday window decorating contest as well. You can vote on which business has the best holiday window display. Like I said, it's a good time to uh, shop your favorite local business. They're gonna be open late for us tonight. And of course, there's parking all across except for where the closed streets are. So you can kind of park all around and it is free parking downtown Bryan. Uh, something else that's happening this weekend, Christmas in the park is officially back and lighting up every night from now until New Year's Day with holiday cheer. And News 3's Andy Krause spoke to some families out there to find out how the display fits into their holiday traditions. It began with a couple of light panels in 1984. Now, Christmas in the Park has grown into a major spectacle that consists of over 1 million lights and hundreds of illuminated panels. We come here every year, every Christmas, we check the light. And it seems like it's getting more and more. You know, everything, everything, is everything is good, everything, everything is, is great, great. You, know, you know, everything, everything is, uh, uh, is beautiful, beautiful the way, the way they, they, they do it. We love the, the walking, walking forest, forest, that, that was fun. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the light of forest, what's it called? The, 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 what's the forest called? Oh, oh, the snowflake forest. forest. The snowflake forest, that was yeah, pretty, yeah. pretty cool. Checking, Checking out the lights, the lights when they're when turned on for the first time every Thanksgiving is a big tradition for some CCS families. It's also a share with friends and family for the holidays. We have a boy to light, you know. Like so, so finally, finally it's here, here, and then and we, we got a chance to, to get our, our friends, friends also, also to be here. It looks like we need to always plan to come this time, time around, around so that we can see the, all these beautiful things. things. The glow from Central, Central Park lets everyone know the holiday, holiday season is finally in full, full swing. swing. This is our favorite time of year. We love being together, together the family. family. Uh, Thanksgiving is kind of uh, it's a tradition that we all get together during Thanksgiving. Uh, we like uh, to do something different, different every time. time. This year we've had some the lights. lights. In, college In College Station, Station Andy, Andy Krause, 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 News 3. Street.
Portland, the U.S. Capitol Christmas tree is shining bright. The 84-foot white fur named Sugar Bear is from the Six Rivers National Forest in California. And fifth grader Michael Mavris, who won an essay contest, helped light the tree last night. Check it out. Five, four, view if you ask me that giant lit tree in front of the capitol building in dc and hey there is something else that i want to tell you about it's happening on sunday okay sunday is a big big game for our aggie women's basketball team they're going to be taking on ut at reed arena yes Horns down, baby. Let's beat University of Texas at Reed Arena. And of course, like Coach Gary Blair says, they need butts in seats. They want to pack the arena. So you can get your tickets now to support our Aggie women's basketball team. So the kickoff, uh, kickoff. so uh, the, uh, the game starts at 3 p.m. Again, it's at home at Reed Arena on Sunday. They are taking on University of Texas. There's something else happening on Sunday, so you could go to the game. You're already going to be on campus after the Aggies beat the Longhorns. And then the Texas A&M Corps of Cadets is going to be hosting Holiday on the Quad. It's an event that's open to Texas A&M and everyone here in the Bryan College Station community. Again, it's happening on Sunday. It starts at 5 on the Quad, which is the home of the Corps of Cadets. And it runs until about 9 o'clock. So go to Reed Arena, cheer on the Aggie women's basketball team, then head over to the quad and celebrate Holiday on the Quad with the Corps of Cadets. It is a free event, and it's also a fundraiser for local nonprofits. So donations are encouraged, but they're not required for most of the booths at the event. Uh, funds donated during the event are going to support all kinds of nonprofits in the area, including Twin City Mission, Habitat for Humanity, Scotty's House, and the Brazos Valley Food Bank. And those attending are also encouraged to bring canned food items to donate to the 12th Canned Food Pantry, which serves students, staff, and faculty at Texas A&M. There's going to be collection boxes set up around the quad. I mean, this is going to be so awesome. It's featuring Christmas lighted decorations and all kinds of booths that have food and hot drinks and games, photo ops for family with Santa Claus. And for the first time, several student organizations from across campus are going to be joining the holiday Black Student Alliance Council, Hispanic Presidents Council, Council for Minority Student Affairs, Native American and Indigenous Student Organizations. They're all going to have booths at the event. And of course, there's photos with Santa and Rubbly. Lots of fun to be had this weekend. Christmas, Hanukkah, and that Aggie women's basketball game. Let's make sure we show up for our community. I am going to end the day with this story. And uh, I watched this for the first time while we were on our break and I was in tears. So happy tears, okay? I just wanna warn you, if if you're emotional like I am, get ready to cry. In a drunk driving accident, she was left paralyzed from the waist down, but she didn't let her disability stop her from living life to the fullest. And this year, she married her fiance, Jay Bloomfield. Chelsea has committed her life to inspiring others. And on her wedding day, she did just that. She decided she wasn't going to roll down the aisle like she originally planned. She was going to walk using leg braces. I've stood up before with the leg braces. I've walked around with them, but nothing like with a long dress on um, and not being able to see my legs. So I had to practice for about six months with the leg braces in order to really know that I could stand there and walk with my eyes forward and not fully at the ground the whole time. Chelsea was nervous for her big day, but she was determined to walk to Jay at the end of the aisle. She said it was difficult, but walking down the aisle to her groom was everything she dreamed of as a little girl. He was turned around facing away. Everyone was facing away. And our officiant said, okay, you may turn around. 
and when he turned around he like dropped I remember looking at him and just being like I did it like I'm here like I did it she only had eyes for Jay so she didn't realize what was going on around her the entire hotel balconies were completely full with people standing there like this so I didn't know that when I was walking down the aisle like every one of our guests like faded away and it was just Jay and I Chelsea said for some people walking isn't the world but for others walking isn't an option no matter what she wants people to know they can make their wedding special no matter their abilities I want people to know that love is love and love is not discriminatory against what you look like or how you talk or anything like that and I just hope people look at it and go wow if she can do it I can do it and if that's something that you want and that's something that's important to you then go for it best story of the day had to save the best for last you know I like to do that all right you guys we are gonna end our show for the day right then and there but before we go, a super quick mental health check-in because we didn't have time at the beginning of the show. So anyone who's tuning in to News 3 Now right now, make sure that today on this Friday, December 3rd, you're doing a mental health check-in. Check in with yourself and your loved ones. Ask them how they're really feeling. Be honest, be open, get the help that you need. Asking for help is the bravest thing you could do and your mental health is more important than anything else in the whole world. I'm talking to you and I'm also talking to myself right now. All right, you guys, with that, we are going to conclude our show. I will be here with you at, for, at uh, First News at four o'clock on KBTX. So we'll see you again at four, but then I will not see you again until Monday morning. So if you're not tuning in at four, I'll say goodbye to you now. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. I'll be out there at downtown in downtown Bryan for First Friday. If you see me, say hello. Can't wait to meet you in person. Um, and I hope you have a great weekend. With that, we are going to end our show now. So if you need this reminder today and through the weekend until I can tell you again on Monday, you are loved and I'm happy that you're here. Happy Friday. Thank you for watching News 3. Local, local, trust, trust. Three. Local, local, trust, trust. trust.